Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is and welcome. Uh, I'm Larry Erickson and this is the Erickson Report. And I'm going to tell you in advance that this time you're going to be subjected to one long extended rant on a single topic. Uh, starting off uh, based on the way I ended the show last time with an issue I said I was going to talk about more. The point that we cannot depend on the Democrats, the Democratic Party to save us from the threats to our future that we face. The fact is we are in a hole. We are in trouble. Uh, recently on, on the, the website Daily Kos, somebody uh, quoted, I think it was a quote from, of a scene from a movie, but apparently the, the villain was saying to the hero of the piece something uh, along the lines of, uh, have you noticed that people are getting meaner? And the hero says, what does that mean? And the villain says, it means your side is losing. And that is what we are seeing. We are seeing people seem to just to get meaner and nastier and we are losing. We are losing ground. We are, we are past the point of trying to hold on to what we already have rather than gaining ground. We are to the point of trying, struggling now to limit how much we lose from what we had. And I have to say, that a significant part of the reason for this is the incompetence and unwillingness to fight to be found in the Democratic Party. We cannot depend on them. We cannot rely on them, or to be more precise, we can rely on them only to the extent that we can force them to act. Now, before people jump on me, as I know some people would or will, uh, I'm not saying all Democrats are bad. Okay, I'm not. Uh, obviously, there are some good progressive Democrats in the House of Representatives. There are a couple more in the Senate. And uh, there are a number of people who on particular issues are quite good. But as an institution, as the institutional Democratic Party, by which I mean the party leadership in the House and Senate, along with the Democratic National Committee and its associated campaign committees, that's simply not true. We can't trust them. We can't rely on them. For one thing, they have become as much a captive of big money as they used to accuse the goppers of being. And they insist on inhabiting, or at least appearing to inhabit, a political world that no longer exists, if, if indeed it ever did. It's a political world where, where respect respect for tradition, traditions of comity, of respectful disagreement leading to compromise, of honest dealing, a world where that continues to exist. Now that political world has not existed at least for decades, if in fact it ever did outside the fantasies of civics classes. But at least since the time of Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich, it is clear that for the right wing, even gestures toward that fantasy, even gestures toward that notion of this tradition have been abandoned. And the Democrats seem incapable of recognizing or dealing with that. I'm going to give you three illustrations, three illustrations of what I'm talking about. Okay. There could be more, but uh, I've just, I've got these three. The first example I'm using because it's the one that has probably gotten the most attention, the one that people are most aware of, is the incoherent, floppy, failed response to the overturning of Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood uh, uh, of America v. Casey uh, in the so-called Dobbs decision, the utter failure on the matter of reproductive rights. It's a failure epitomized by House Majority Whip James Clyburn, who dismissed the reversal of Roe as anticlimactic and said, this is a quote, we all expected this. And then went on to saying how he was considering the extent to which we could legislatively respond to it. Yes, we knew this was coming. We know that at least for months since the, since the draft version of the ruling was released. In fact, we've known it for years. We've known that the, that the right wing has been on an active campaign for years to bring things to this point. We've known it was coming for a long time. So 
Why, uh, Representative Clyburn, why weren't you ready? Why weren't you ready with a response? Meanwhile, anger also erupted at the Senate Judiciary Committee, which said in the wake of the ruling that they're going to be holding a hearing sometime next month about the future of a post-Roe America. Why wasn't that already teed up, ready to go? Meanwhile, Xavier Becerra, he's the Secretary of Health and Human Services, proudly declared a response from the Blood administration, a response consisting of citing policies and regulations that already existed. Now, during the weeks since, they've actually made some strong statements drawn from that. For example, that they, uh, they reminded medical personnel of a federal law called the Emergency Medical Treatment and Act of Labor Act of 1986, which essentially says that if a woman is in an ER and she needs an abortion to save her life or to protect her health, then she gets one. State law be damned or you lose your Medicare and Medicaid funding. HHS has also reminded pharmacists that they must dispense prescribed medications for miscarriages and, uh, uh, and early term uh, um, abortions. And if they don't, there are potential criminal sanctions that can come. And Attorney General Merrick Garland simmer, similarly issued a statement that states cannot ban mifepristone, uh, which is a drug approved by the FDA for early pregnancy termination, as well as for other uses. So they, they cannot, states cannot ban this. But again, 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 the question is why? First, why did it take weeks to issue these statements? Why weren't these statements ready the day the decision came down since we all expected this, especially since all this does, again, is state already existing policies, laws, and regulations? Meanwhile, any actual dramatic responses are off the table. For example, Biden was urged to uh, publicly call on Congress to limit the Supreme Court's jurisdiction in matters like this, which Congress can do under the Constitution. He was urged to call on Congress to expand the membership of the court, which the Congress can do under the Constitution. Uh, he was urged to call on the Senate to get rid of the um, uh, get rid of the, the filibuster, which it can do anytime it wants. He was urged to uh, approve building abortion clinics on federal lands outside the reach of state laws, of declaring a national emergency, of establishing Planned Parenthood clinics, clinics outside U.S. national parks and with appropriate agreement on tribal lands. He was urged to do all of that and more, and none of it is happening. None of it. Why? Well, according to Reuters, it's because the administration is concerned that more radical moves would be politically polarizing ahead of the midterm elections. Like we are not already polarized as a nation. Like, and in fact, this, this fear, you know what this actually translates to? It translates to, we're afraid the right wing will say nasty things about us. He also said, oh, we don't want to do this because it might undermine trust in institutions like the Supreme Court. Like trust in the Supreme Court does not deserve to be undermined. Like it wasn't according to, according to polls in the wake of the Dobbs decision, it has not already been undermined. But then he said, well, but, you know, it, it, uh, we, we want to make sure that our things uh, have strong legal footing. All right, you're not sure that something would have strong legal footing? Do it anyway and fight for it in court. Instead, we have this whining, we're doing the best we can, vote for us, Bull, when what we're really seeing is a, is a fear to really enter the fight. We are seeing what I have come to call preemptive capitulation of surrendering before the fight actually starts. Which is why this next thing is actually related. Uh, there recently was a Democratic Party primary runoff in Texas. 
Uh, Representative Henry Cuellar defeated a progressive challenger named Jessica Cisneros by something like 300 votes after having been endorsed and backed by essentially the entire Democratic Party establishment. Now, the reason it's important is because Cuellar is not only anti-gun control, he's anti-choice. In fact, he's the only openly anti-choice Democrat in the House. But protecting him against a progressive challenger, protecting the incumbent, protecting the insider, was more important to the party establishment than uh, upholding and, and advancing the principles and policies in which the party apparently falsely claims to believe. Now, the you know, abortion... The issue of abortion, of, of reproductive rights, you know, like was, was sparked uh, this, this whole conversation about how can we actually trust and rely on these people. Well, it's not the only example. Since we're talking about courts, let's look at federal judgeships. Um, despite the fact, despite the fact that a good part of the straits that we are in arise from a successful years and years long campaign by the right wing to stuff the federal judiciary with fellow traveler right wing flakes. Despite that, less than a week after the Supreme Court gave American women the finger, President Joe Bladen was ready to cut a deal with the man he said is his friend, Mitch Fishface McConnell, to nominate a Republican anti-choice lawyer to a lifetime's appointment as a federal district court judge in exchange for McConnell's approval of two U.S. attorneys in Kentucky. In other words, exchanging a lifetime appointment on the federal bench in exchange for two temporary appointments that could well last only as long as the, uh, as the Blond administration. And despite a huge outcry from his own party on this, Bladen was apparently ready to go through with this until Rand Paul, who, like McConnell, is from Kentucky, started fussing about having not been consulted on this. But, you know, it's more. The issue is more than that one opening. It's about a whole bunch of openings. Democrats have been so lackadaisical about pushing through nominees to the federal courts that it's predicted that a dozen or so positions on federal circuit courts of appeals will remain open at the end of this year because Democrats just didn't get the nominations through fast enough. And if Dems lose the Senate, if they lose the Senate in the midterms, those positions are going to remain open because you know that the just like they did with Merrick Garland, goppers will block any nominee uh, if they control the Senate, just leaving the positions open until they hope some future gopper president will uh, be there to appoint people that they want. And what makes this even more ridiculous, make this even more ridiculous, is knowing that, knowing that the goppers will oppose, block, and resist. Democrats insist on going with so-called moderate nominees, that is, nominees uh, sufficiently inoffensive to the right wing. And doing this in the hope of, as BloombergLaw.com put it, not ruffling feathers. And to top it off, top it all this, there's this blue slip business. If you don't know what this is, it's a tradition in the Senate that a nominee for the federal courts has to have the approval of the senators from which that nominee comes. For example, if you're from, say, Iowa, if either of the senators from Iowa object to you being nominated to that position, you don't get nominated. And it's called the, the blue slip for some reason. Well, during the Tweety Pie administration, the goppers in control of the Senate wanted to push through as many circuit court judges as they could. In fact, they pushed through, I think it was either 56 or 58 in that four-year period. One of the ways they did this is by saying, well, for circuit court judges, blue slips, forget it. That doesn't apply anymore. And in at least 17 cases, they ignored objections from Democratic senators to a particular nominee. So now, actually, they can't do that now. Uh, uh, at the present day, now with the Democratic Senate, they, they can't do that with circuit courts. But they can still do it with district courts. And despite the fact that 
the Democrats have to know that if the Goppers get back control of the Senate and want to push through district court nominees, they'll just dump the, that blue slip business as fast as your head can spin. Despite knowing that, the Democrats now are still letting the Goppers get away with it to block circuit court, uh, a district court rather, nominees. Because, you know, tradition, comedy, and all of that. I've got one more example here. Okay, one more example. Climate change. Now, e even though, you know, the, the diehard fanatics, the conspiracy, conspiracy eaters, the brain-dead conspiracy eaters, and, and the corporate butt-kissers will continue to insist uh, that, that climate change isn't real or not so bad or whatever, it's, it's irrational especially in the face of the kind of heat waves that we've seen recently, it's irrational to continue to deny that it is already here. It's already, not it's a future impact, present day impact. More than 100 million people in the lower 48 were under heat advisories this past week as temperatures in some places reached 115 degrees. There were dozens, dozens of daily high temperature records set in the U.S. over this past week. And it's not just us. It's not just us either. Europe, um, Africa, Central Asia, uh, China have all experienced this. There are, there are a number of cases where, you know, there, there's the daily highs. Hit a record, tie or break a record daily high. It's the hottest that day in July has ever been. Then there, then there are numerous records where it was the hottest day in July any time in the month of July that it's ever been. And there are a number of cases, too, where it was the highest temperature that site had ever recorded any day, any time. Across the world, thousands of people have died in this heat wave. A few months ago, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres commented on the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. He called it a code red for humanity. Is quoting him, the alarm bells are deafening, the evidence is irrefutable. More recently, he said that the goal of limiting global warming to the, the goal of the goal of limiting it to warming to one and a half degrees Celsius is quote on life support, unquote. And he was actually predicting that the next summit um, would probably not see governments make the commitments necessary to keep us from blowing straight through that level. So, here in the U.S., here in the U.S., where are we in terms of that needed additional federal action on climate change? Essentially, we're nowhere. Nowhere at all. Now, before I get to the Senate and the, the elephant in the room, or I should say the donkey in the room, I suppose, um, I'm going to make a quick detour to the House of Representatives. Since February of 2021, H.R. 794, the Climate Emergency Act, has been sitting, just sitting on the table in the House Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change. It has 54 co-sponsors. Nothing has been done on this bill. It's been there for nearly 18 months and nothing has happened. But in fairness, in fairness, so the point is it's not just the Senate, but in fairness, even if that bill were to get a vote, uh, get a hearing, get a vote, and be passed by the House, it would still face the forever roadblock of the Senate. Because it's been the Senate that has blocked action on climate change. Uh, it b blocked Bill Clinton's energy tax in 1993. It blocked uh, Obama's climate bill in 2009. It, now it's blocked Biden's clean energy investment uh, program in 2022. But the difference this time, the difference in 2022, is that this time the issue there can be reduced to a single person whose duplicity and personal greed drove the final nail into the coffin of doing anything. The person was, of course, West Virginia Senator Joe Malevolent. After stringing party leadership and the media along for weeks, Senator Malice, who is a coal millionaire and uh, gets more money, uh, more campaign contributions, in other words, legal bribery, from the fossil fuel industry than any other person in Washington, D.C., this person 
after all this time, just said, uh, actually, I can't support any new spending on climate change. In the words of uh, Varshini Prakash, who is the executive director of the youth-led Sunrise Movement, this is nothing short of a death sentence. And that is absolutely true. People will die as a result of this. No one should have been surprised by this betrayal. No one should have been surprised. I mean, to quote Representative Clyburn, we all saw this coming. Because this is the same thing that uh, Senator Malice did with the Build Back Better program. There were weeks of supposed negotiations of going back and forth of, well, maybe I could support this, but I can't support that. But maybe if we adjust this this way, maybe we can find some blah, 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 compromise this, that, and the other thing. And at the end of it, it just became a flat no to the point of outright rejecting things that previously he said he would support. So why in, that, in the face of that history, why this time wasn't there a plan B? Why weren't they prepared for the event, the eventuality of, of, the, of him just pulling the rug out from under the negotiations. Uh, yes, 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 yes. I know about the goppers. I know there's 50 of them, and if any of them, one or two of them, would cross party lines, that this wouldn't be an issue at all. Yes, I know all that. First off, that's not the topic under discussion. The multitude failures of the goppers are not the issue of dis under discussion here. But... The, the other point here is, of course, you know, we couldn't be surprised that the goppers would oppose it. I mean, it could have been ice cream and cake for the entire population uh, with extra scoopings for Republicans. Um, and they still would have been against it because it could have been presented as a political victory for a Democratic presidential administration. So, of course, they were going to be against it. But the failure I'm talking about here. The failure I'm talking about here is the failure of the Democratic establishment to deal with, the, and I don't mean negotiate, means I mean deal with Senator Malignant. Why did he get away with this? Remember, this, is, this was not a matter of conscience. This was not a matter of even honest disagreement. It was a matter of one person getting his rocks off by being the center of attention and uh, power while actually being interested only in his own personal benefit. Why was Senator Malefactor able twice to undermine a major policy proposal, uh, one of the major policy proposals for an entire session of Congress from his own party without any consequences at all? I mean, I'll give you one good example. Why is this man still chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee? And we hear, oh, but we hear, oh, we got to be careful dealing with him because, you know, it's 50-50 and, you know, he might jump to the Republicans and then where will you be? Well, in terms of major, major uh, policies and major programs, we'd pretty much be exactly where we are anyway. But the point here is he's not going to jump parties. I mean, no, he's just not. I mean, he just, you know, he may be just self-interested, but he's not an idiot. His entire power, the reason he gets on TV all the time, the reason he has all this power, the reason he gets so much flattery about his importance is because it is a 50-50 Senate. He jumps parties and he becomes 51-49 Gopper. And he instantly goes back to being Senator Joe Who. And what's more, if you think, if you think that uh, Fishface McConnell would put up with the kind of crap that Chuck Schmoozer and the rest of them are putting up with from this guy. If you think he would put up with that, you have not been paying attention. Despite that, despite having to know he's not going to jump parties, despite knowing what all this is about, he got away with it twice. And again, it was not conscience or an honest disagreement. It was pure selfishness, which means the ultimate response, the party response to this betrayal of our future was nothing. And yet we are supposed to put our trust and faith in those same people. We can't. Nor does it seem we can put our faith or trust in the White House. Blodden called climate change, quote, this is a quote, is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. But despite that, his only actual responses now 
have been a few moves to, to, to ameliorate heat waves, like enabling more air conditioners to be supplied, and pushing an offshore wind project, which is good, but while at the same time supporting an oil and gas project in Alaska, among other fossil fuel projects. And meanwhile, he's been dithering and blathering about how the administration is thinking about, we could, we might, maybe sometime in the next couple of weeks, we could declare a climate emergency, which would give him additional powers, which uh, he could use, but he just doesn't seem willing to. In fact, you know, one of the, one of the powers, the, the, the Brennan Center at the New York University School of Law came up with a list of, I think it was 136 laws, existing laws that give presidents various powers in the event of a national emergency. One of them, it struck me, I forget the name of the law, but what it does is it gives the president the authority in the event of an emergency that arises largely from outside the United States, which actually applies to climate change, um, gives him the authority to actually regulate certain commercial transactions among designated entities. Which means that um, what I think should have happened is that when, when um, Joe Malevolent was, was pulling this, this shtick, that he should have been called into the White House. Bladen should have called him in for, we're going to have a little talk, Joe. Now, um, I understand that you're not really supportive of these moves on climate change, but um, I'd urge you to reconsider because, you see, if you don't do anything, I'm going to have to declare a national emergency, which would, among other things, enable me to regulate the financial transactions of fossil fuel industries. And frankly, I don't think your backers are going to be very happy with that prospect. So maybe you need to rethink your opposition. And frankly, part of the failure of the Democrats is that not only wasn't that done, I doubt they even thought of it. But I guess more on this is going to have to wait till next time. By which time, maybe he'll have done something. Maybe he'll even declared an emergency, in which case I could take some of this back happily. But the bottom line is we cannot rely on these people except to the extent we can force them to act. So I'm going to end here by reminding you of what I said last time. Do you think civil rights were won in the halls of Congress? You think the Indochina War was ended in the halls of Congress? You think environmental protection was won in the halls of Congress? You think voting rights, LGBTQ plus rights? Do you think women's rights? You think labor rights? You think any of these were won in the halls of Congress? Not secured in law in the halls of Congress, but won in Congress. The answer is none of them were. None of them were. They were one in the streets. They were one through activity, action, including things like civil disobedience, social disruption, and creating an atmosphere where people could not ignore the importance and relevance of these and the justice of doing something about it. Yes, vote. Vote, absolutely vote, support candidates, uh, uh, contribute to them, volunteer for them, absolute vote, yes. But never for an instant think that's enough. Voting harder will not get us out of this. That's it, I'm done, I'm out of here. I'll see you as soon as we can. In the meantime, you have the best time you possibly can. And as always, peace.